This week's mailbag comes to us from Trisha. I thought the Sunday basket was a filing system, but it is so much more. The planning aspect, add an entire dimension. It is great to have a place to put papers until I am ready to handle them. I know where to go when I'm ready to work. I also like the idea of writing down thoughts and ideas and putting them on cards so they can be out of your head but still accessible. It is also great to be able to have the pink slash pockets and think about your personal goals. And the 2.0 slash pockets really help me break down what I am doing at home as a homeschool mom. Thank you so much for this system. I will tell others about this tool. Do you have an Organized 365 success story? If so, we would love to hear about it. Please send us an email at customer service at Organize 365 and tell us how you have taken back your home, your paper, and your life with Organize 365. Welcome to the Organize 365 podcast. I'm your host, professional organizer, productivity expert, and motivational speaker, Lisa Woodruff. This podcast will help you embrace progress over perfection and create lasting functional organizing in your home. I have so much to share with you, so let's get started. Oh my goodness, the paper solution is finally here. Virtually run to your favorite book retailer and get your copy. The paper solution is the proven step-by-step guide for what to shred, what to save, and how to sort all the paper you've been saving in boxes, bins, piles, and files. 85% of the papers you saved can be purged. The paper solution will hold your hand as you start your own big paper sort and your weekly Sunday basket routine. In celebration of the Paper Solution book launch this month, I'm going to deep dive into the 15% of papers you'll want to save. Only, I don't counsel you to save them in files. We are ditching the filing cabinet and storing our savable papers in organized, portable binders. America is a paper-based society. We can have less paper, but we will never be paperless. Listen as I dive into another paper pile to help you get it sorted. This month, I'm giving you quick, short, actionable podcasts on how to create the binders that will help you ditch the filing cabinet so that you can have portable, productive, functional binders that will give you the papers that you need and eliminate the 85% that you don't need. This week, we're gonna dive into the financial binder. Now, I'll be honest. The financial binder is the last binder that I did for myself, which is crazy. I mean, it's probably the most important. It organizes your past, present, and future money, but I kept putting it off, and I'm not really sure why I kept putting it off. Probably because we usually have debt, and I like don't want to know how many debts that we have, but also... I don't have a 401k. Uh, I don't have a retirement account. I actually just started one this month. And I have always worked from home, but I primarily have identified as a homemaker. And my husband has worked from the day he graduated college at the same job for the last 30 years. And he has multiple great 401ks. And I I don't know. I, I think it's it's definitely just a me thing. But maybe some other women feel the same way. Like, I know it's our money. He says it's our money, but I have not contributed to any 401k growth. And so I felt kind of awkward um, asking for all the information. Like until recently, I didn't have life insurance either. Like, Like Greg had all those financial things and he's always been great with, he's a saver and he's good with the finances and I stimulate the economy and use credit cards and (laughs) buy cute clothes. Um, And so the financial binder, I had kind of a mindset thing I had to get over in order to create my financial binder. The thing that really helped me with that was being the executor of my grandmother's estate before she passed. And I did not actually, I did not actually do her estate when she passed somebody else was the executor but i was put in charge as the executor as the oldest grandchild at one point and she went through with me all of her money i was put on all of her bank accounts she showed me exactly what was going to happen for a funeral and like she had it all laid out like she was german like it's all organized and this was after my father had passed and when my father passed 10 years ago i was the executor of the estate i will tell you one thing 
My sister and I were both named co-executors of the estate in the will. Do not do that. Um, not because you don't want to have two executors, but it's super, super hard. If you have two executors of a will, then you both have to sign everything. And Emily and I lived four hours apart from each other. So she acquiesced to me and I became the executor of the estate because I could handle that from Cincinnati and she could take care of the family home and everything that had to happen up there. So we divided the work, but I was the executor of the state. So I was dealing with the banks and the credit card companies and the three lawyers, et cetera, and on and on and on. Being the executor of my father's estate was weird. It was so weird because my parents had never talked to me before about money. Um, growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. And then when my father passed, he did have money and my parents did have money when I was in high school, college and beyond. But it was never talked about. It was just like bills weren't a problem anymore, but it wasn't discussed. And I knew that we owned our house, like my, my parents owned their house. Um, but I didn't know much else. Like there were filing cabinets worth of paper, but there was no binder. There was no checklist. There was no, you know, way to ask dad any questions. My parents had been divorced, so I couldn't ask my mom. And so um, we had to piece together through that filing cabinet. It was a jigsaw puzzle for my sister and I to piece together the record, the maintenance records of the house so we could sell it, the financial records so that we could track everything down, put it in the estate, distribute it to the descendants. Like all of that had to be done. It took a lot of time. It was very stressful. And I felt like I was violating my dad's privacy and my mom's. I mean, she was still alive and lived somewhere else. And so some of these files were still related to her. And even though my sister and I were in our 30s, like, I felt like a 12-year-old little kid looking through my parents' files and that they were going to come in there and catch me at any minute. Um, but yet that was my role and responsibility. And I tell you all this because, you know, when we are going through our busy days and we kind of know where our money is and where all the passwords are, et cetera, et cetera, um, we don't take time to put that in a nice, neat format for someone else to advocate or take care of us on our behalf even spouses. So Greg has now given me all the passwords for all the 401ks and retirement and life insurance and all these things. And he hands it to me and I go, fine, fine, fine. And I just shove it in the binder. Like I don't even look at it because I don't want to think about when I would need that information, right? Like I don't ever want to need that information. But just because I don't want to need that information doesn't mean I shouldn't have it and I shouldn't know where it is. So I think doing the financial binder for me and getting it ready kind of said that someday someone will need this. Someone will need this to advocate for my kids, for my kids to settle our estate, for our assets to be dispersed for our kids. Um, you know, we set up a trust. We had a will, living will, all those things, but now we've set up a trust. And oh my gosh, it's hilarious. My trust is like 12 pages long. Like, first this and then this and here's how much they can have for a wedding and here's how much they <laughs> Greg looked at he goes what is this I'm like well if I'm not here I want him to know I want the kids to know how I would have spent the money on them like I don't know what to tell you like here's here's how we would have distributed it to you here's when we think it's a good time to, for you to get this this is what you get for a wedding this is your Christmas gift this is your birthday gifts like I have it all spelled out in there in case anything happened to me and we don't want to think about it we don't and and we use the excuse that, well, if we put all the passwords there, then it's not safe. Here, newsflash. Yes, correct. It's not safe if it's all in a binder. However, I mean, who breaks into a house and goes through your files to find your social security number? No, they take a TV. Like, I mean, that's not usually how identity theft happens. And I just can't live in that fear. Like, put it in a safe deposit box. Do whatever you want with it. But don't not do it because somebody might steal it one day. It's way more likely that a family member will need that information to act on your behalf or to uh, settle things based on your wishes than that someone will come into your house, steal the binder, and steal your identity. Like of the two things, one is going to happen, no doubt, and the other one is never gonna happen. Like to never gonna happen. I can't even say a percentage of when it would happen. So the financial binder actually, it has pieces in there for your past, current, and future money, but I, have a money pocket inside of my Sunday basket that I use for my current money. So our bills that need to be paid and all of that is in my Sunday basket. I just use my financial binder for um, loans that have been paid off, 
life insurance, health insurance, 401k, there is a section in there for celebrating life. It's designed to be the binder that you can literally buy and fill in all of the sheets and take it to a lawyer and settle an estate, done. Like I have worked with so many people as a professional organizer and they, and numerous times I have been taken with the client to a lawyer's office. And I will say after going through the filing cabinets, we didn't get this money. Did you find this bank account? What about this? And they're like, no. And I said, well, why didn't you? And they're like, because I'm not in the house. I don't know what paper they have. Estate lawyers can help you settle estates when you bring them the right paperwork, but they don't have a checklist for you always for all of the paper that will be in your filing cabinet. But if all of your financial papers are in a binder and you hand them to an estate lawyer, first of all, you just saved yourself thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. And second of all, they literally can go through that binder in an hour or two and give you clear direction of what you need to do in order to settle the estate. I looked high and low 10 years ago for any kind of tutorial, binder, help of any sort whatsoever to give me a roadmap to settle this estate. And there just wasn't any. There's an estate lawyer that costs a fortune and then there's like one or two books on the market that are kind of good, but there's no fill in this binder and you're gonna be done. That is what our financial binder, it is. Fill in this binder and you're gonna be done. And we don't wanna settle people's estates. We don't wanna lose loved ones. We don't wanna think about one day someone having to settle our estate for us. But just because we don't want to think about it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And for those of us that do take the time to put all of our finances and our passwords and the updated contacts, and I go through this on a yearly basis when I do my tax returns, I now scan the tax returns and then I go through the financial binder. And if any of our you know, insurance agents or their contact information has changed, I update it in that binder so that in the future, Anyone that needs to advocate on Greg's on my behalf will have everything that they need. And God forbid Greg or I need to settle each other's estate. We will have what we need in a time when we definitely will not be thinking clearly, when that is the least uh, thing that we're going to want to be spending our time on. It will give us the time and the freedom to be spending with family and friends and reminiscing and celebrating life instead of going through old filing cabinets, trying to make sure that we don't miss any monies that were shoved in a file somewhere that we have forgotten about. So if you are in the paper solution, there are some free printables for you to download. Uh, the free printable to download is the adult family information sheet. And on that is all of the information that every single person that I contacted on my dad's behalf needed. Like I didn't realize people need your driver's license number. They need your driver's license number. They need your mother's maiden name. Um, they need to know if you have any military benefits. I forgot that my father did and we got a flag for that. So that one sheet that you can download that's part of your purchase in the paper solution, that is on page 196. And then if you go to page 198, that's all the papers that you're gonna to wanna to gather together um, in order to make your financial binder. And page 199 and 200 is gonna lay out the different sections that you're gonna have in that binder. Okay, another binder coming up next week. I feel like we're living in a snow globe. No, it's not cold here. Snow globes are room temperature, you might remember. No, it's the constant shaking up of my life that has me feeling this way. Every time I feel like I have a plan, my 2020 snow globe gets shaken up and I find myself running all around trying to catch little pieces of my life and putting them back in place. It's surreal. I thought by now it would be over. Maybe you can relate. I don't really have a point. <laughs> Often on the podcast, you'll tell me that I'm able to articulate in words how you're feeling. Lost. We're feeling lost. Often when you pose one big question or frustration with me about your home organization, I stop and I redirect that conversation back to you. What can you control? And while it feels like we have very little control, we do have some. We can control our morning and evening routine. We can control how much we clean our house. We can control most of what we eat. We can control what we listen to, read, and watch. We can control, to a degree, our mood. For most of us, we can control the majority of what happens in our homes. A safe at home is a theme I started in the spring. Largely, we are safe at home. 
In September, I will be unpacking how we can start to recreate our routines, take back our mental outlook on life, and rekindle lost passions and hobbies we had as we head into the winter months. I'm done waiting for outside forces to unify and make decisions for me. I'm ready to take back control of my days and weeks as much as I know how. So take some time and enjoy the last days of summer as stressful as they are this year. We'll be back inside soon enough and I can't wait to unpack how we can reclaim our lives this fall together.